brother passed away. So we pray for him. I'll tell you, we all need each other's prayers. Yeah. It's very difficult. Okay. Let's see what Brother Blaine does today. I guess he expects me to give these out. Could just give you the answers and make it one of two. In fact, I think I will. If you get the Lord to give you an okay, you can look at it. And as you go, I mean, I don't care. The Lord don't care. I'll tell you what, I'll turn it upside down so you won't be tempted. Okay? All right. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it's a blessing. Tell you, we're just a part of it. Yeah. Uh, you can fill these out as we go through the lesson. Uh, and listen, I am not. Don't you email me these. Don't, don't do it. You just keep them for the uh, if we, in case we have some kind of final or something. And then most of the time, we're pretty lenient. I really don't. I have to give tests, but I don't. Not so interested in this. A lot of people can retain more without that pressure. Some people do it on test. Five minutes after they took the test, they don't remember anything. I'm not interested in how good you did the test. What I am interested in is what you can retain, what help you can get. And that's why we're here. That's the only reason. I mean, we're trying just to help people. And certainly we want people to learn, but we're not so interested in test, pass, fail. But gee, that's what you write on that if you want to. And this, this is the answers. But you don't have to. You don't have to. Uh, and hopefully I'll cover everything when we go through these. Hey, Brother Nathan. How are you? Some stuff right here, brother. Okay. One of these. One of these. This is the e book. It is very good. It's, it's the book of the seven laws of teaching. This is a study, study guide for Tony's class. Uh, and, and that's from one of those. Got the way through. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll put this away. And we will try to get started. Brother J.T. Byerly always said, when I was in Bible college, start on time and you stop on time. And, and that's very true in a lot of things. But it's good to be here tonight. And I do appreciate you. A lot to be praying about. Certainly we're going to remember uh, Brother Tony, Brother Brady Hayward. Brother Tony had eye surgery. Uh, Brother Hayward is uh, uh, he's recovering from COVID. I ask you to remember him, and then also a host of other names in the Marlowe family. Let's pray for them tonight. Um, I ask you to remember churches that are having revival meetings. Uh, Charity Hill Baptist Church is having a revival this week. Uh, Brother Jimmy Millsaps is with them. Uh, he's a great man of God. Uh, had the privilege last night to go to hear him. Uh, but I wonder tonight, Brother Dewey's family, let's remember them. Uh, the Breed families, a lot of sickness today, uh, a lot of situations, circumstances. Uh, but let's do remember the Lord. Let's do
yes to that. Yes. Hey Amen. Thank you, Brother Bell, for the good prayer. I just got to check. Brother Neil, you're good to go. Recording. All right. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Benjamin Rhodes. Uh, he is somewhere in the great state of Ohio. He's one of our members of the church and uh, he is uh, one of the computers and all these things that I'm not one of them with and he logged on and he's already got my computer going so I'm thankful for him for that. If you have your Bible tonight, I want to encourage you to turn with me to Titus chapter number 2. I'm going to read down through verse 1, down through verse number 10 and we've been talking, Brother Tony was talking last week about teaching on teaching. Can I say to you, uh, it is one of the most important. Everybody is, is not born a natural teacher. Everybody's not. And there's a lot of people that are not born, but there are some people that are gifted in teaching. And uh, Brother Tony closed out last week, I think he said, education is a process. Words drive us to facts. Facts drive us to thoughts. Thoughts drives us to truths. Truths drives us to principles. And then principles drive us to decisions. Decisions drive us to actions. And actions, that's the purpose of education. Bible teaching is a process that brings its hearers to a proper action. And we want the gospel message to go out. Children need to be taught the gospel. Young people need to be taught the gospel. Older people need to be taught the gospel. So yes, education is a process. In Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, Paul wrote these words and he said, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. Now I want to say that. You can look that up and get the understanding that doesn't mean that drink alcohol. It means to be sober-minded. And uh, I, I'm totally against a professed Christian drinking alcohol. In fact, our church covenant talks about that. And it talks about not only drinking, but also the sale of intoxicating liquors. I don't think that a Christian should be a bartender. Amen? You're saved by the grace of God. You shouldn't do that. I don't think you should be on a, an airplane serving liquor. As a steward is. I mean, I think there's some things that we should be coming out from. So to be sober is to be sober-minded, to be grave, to be temperate. And I'm not going to look at up all these words. I hope that you have a strong concordance. If you don't, I would encourage you to get eSword for your phone or your tablet. eSword is a free download, and you can put uh, the strong concordance on there. Look up Bible words and get deeper in your Bible study. Every Bible student needs to have a way to study those words to get the definitions of these words. Grave, temperance, sound in faith, in charity, in, in patience. Verse 3, the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. And then verse number 10, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Verse number 10 will be our text verse tonight, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now I'm going to define some words tonight, and you might want to uh, to put down and try to uh, to put down a letter to try to get <clears throat> that word with uh, what it means. And uh, purloining, 
Now, it means to keep back, or the big word is, uh, help me see, sequester. I get tongue-tied. Thank you so much for saying that. Uh, I would want to say something else. And, and I even wrote how to say it on my paper tonight. So I, I get tongue-tied. I'm just being honest. And, and I do. It's amazing to me that God uh, could use somebody like me as tongue-tied as I get from time to time. But I want to tell you, God uses the weak things. He uses the things that nobody else sees any good in. And God can do that. So to sequester. It means uh, to, to keep back. And as we think about this, and, and I want to say this, this is the only time that you're going to find this word in the entirety of the Bible. And it's an interesting word. Then the word fidelity means persuasion. It means conviction of religious truth, reliance upon Christ for salvation. And it's the only time fidelity is found in the Bible. That's first, uh, question three. Uh, question two, I hope you got that. And then question five is the word adorn. It means, and, it, and it's actually only found twice in the Bible, here in our text verse and in 1 Timothy 2, 9. But it means to put in proper order, to garnish, to decorate, to trim. And then the word doctrine. Doctrine means instruction. It means the function or the information. It means learning and it means teaching. So this verse could be, rightfully thought of in this manner. May I paraphrase this in a way that you and I may understand it a little bit better. That we, you and I, should not withhold the truth of God's Word, but we should persuade men that they might themselves apply to their life the proper truths of God's Word by God's approved method of teaching. I want to say we shouldn't hold back on the truth of God's Word. There's a lot of places that they don't like to hear the word hell. There's a lot of places today that don't want to hear about the blood. But you know what? That's withholding the word of God. My job as a minister, a pastor, a God-called man of God is to preach the whole counsel of the word of God. Some time ago, and I'm just I'm going to run a rabbit here for just a moment. I promise you, it'll be a short rabbit trip. Amen. We're just going to run this bunny. I've already got the side on him. I'm getting ready to pull trigger on the bunny trail. But let me say this tonight. I believe that preaching through books of the Bible is one way to deal with preaching the whole counsel of the Word of God. I used to hunt and peck for a sermon, man. I, I would open the Bible and I'd stay up till 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning on Saturday praying and sweating and crying and Sunday morning would come 2 o'clock in the morning sometimes and I still wasn't settled because there's so many places in the Word of God but a few years ago, God allowed me to preach through the, God, the book of Genesis. And I went through the book of all 50 chapters, and it took us about seven years on Wednesday night. Amen. And it did. And my daughter counted the time up. You better believe she did. And then after that, the Lord led me to preach through the gospel of Luke. When I got done with Luke, God took me to the book of Matthew. And I don't know why it's so mixed. I'm flopping around from book to book. But I'm preaching consistently and succinctly through the Word of God. Can I tell you? You say, preacher, do you believe that God's really in that? Oh, yes, I do. Because this past year, I preached on such subjects as divorce. And I preach what the Bible says about it. You know? And those are taboo stuff. People don't want to hear that. But if you preach through a book of the Bible, you can deal with that. What does God say about homosexuality? Preach through the book of the Word, the Word of God, and you'll be able to deal with those subjects and nobody will come up to you and be able to say that you're picking on us or that you have a pet peeve. And boy, I tell you, you say, well, you think God's really in that? Oh, yes, He is. And that's all the rabbit trail I'm running tonight. I'll just say that. Let me give you an example. I believe that men, we should wear a shirt, Pants, socks, and shoes to Sunday service. Don't you? And and I, I and I personally, and, and you don't have when I go to India, buddy, I want to tell you, and I've been to India five or six times, I don't wear a tie when I go to India. You know why? Because they don't wear neckties most of the time in their services. They wear a white shirt with khaki pants. You know what I wear when I go to India? I wear a white shirt with khaki pants. But here in America, I've always worn a necktie when I preach the Word of God. Is there anything wrong with preaching without a necktie? Absolutely not. 
but I think that I should wear the necktie and it's an ornament and it is and it's something to use to make the rest of what I'm wearing more attractive and that's the reason that I wear a, a necktie and you know what I'll give you a word of caution there's a fine line between making teaching or preaching interesting or just entertaining now I want to say that you need to make it interesting if you're boring if you, hey you need to reflect your voice you need to raise your voice up and down especially when you see people knocking off to sleep and then sometimes I'll come down out of the pulpit when I'm preaching and I see somebody that's a little bit sleepy-headed. I go over close to them. Sometimes I even put my hand on their shoulder. Amen? And, and I don't ever tell them why I'm doing that, but I'm trying to stir them up and trying to wake them up. And sometimes we need to do that, even in a Sunday school class. We can, we can soften our voice. We can lift it up. And we do these things as a, in an ornament and like a necktie. We want uh, to be the best that we can do. And we don't, we're not here to entertain. We're not here to teach the Word of God. We're here to give the truth of the Word of God. But let me say this, and I question tonight. I, I, I'm going to take a survey here. And, and again, there's a fine line between teaching and preaching that's interesting or entertaining. But how many of you like plain almonds tonight? How many of you like plain almonds? How many of you like chocolate covered almonds? How many of you like a plain chocolate bar? Uh, people are different. People are different. I want to be honest with you. If I eat almonds, I want salt and vinegar almonds. You ever tried them? If you ain't, you ain't lived. I'm telling you, man alive, they're so good. That's my favorite. But you know what? We're different. Most folks would prefer the chocolate-covered almonds over the plain, except for me. I like salt and vinegar. Most folks would prefer the chocolate-covered almonds over the plain chocolate bar. That's what they say is survey. But we will use almonds, chocolate-covered almonds, and a chocolate bar as an example. And you can start off with the covered almonds, just, just the plain almonds. And before long, if you're not careful, you can be feeding people chocolate bars if you're not careful. And I want to say this. Church is more than just feeding what people want. It's giving the truth of God's Word. And if you want to know the truth, take a survey of your class if you have the nerve. Ask your teenagers. If you if you want to get a paper survey, it might shock you. Can I say it? They might say almonds, plain almonds is boring, Brother Nathan. And entertainment is as a chocolate bar. It might taste good at the moment. But I'm going to be honest with you. There's no substance to it. You eat a chocolate bar, you're going to get a, a sugar rush, a calorie rush, and you may get a little caffeine out of it for a moment or two. But the next thing you know, you're going to become lower than you were uh, before you ate it. So we need to be careful what we're feeding people. And that is exactly what teaching is and preaching as well. It is feeding people who are hungry. And it's important. If teaching and preaching is boring, that they'll, one of the things they'll do is they'll turn you off and then you've lost them. And I, I'm, I'm not for that. I believe you need to be engaged in your class and in teaching. Listen to me. I, there's two kinds of preaching. That, that, that really makes me want to preach. It's a preacher that, 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 that can preach and, and then a preacher that can't preach. Those two preachers make me really want to preach. And it's the same way with teaching. If you get the privilege to teach, make it enjoyable for the class. Make it engaging for the class. But don't entertain. Give the Word of God. Give the truth of God's Word. It'll help you. There are times in my preaching when I'm preaching along and I see that people are drifting, you know what I do? Sometimes I'll inject a little humor and it helps. It brings them back in. You know, you got to reel them back in. You got to keep people engaged. And if you don't, man, there's so many other things that they could be doing. I'll be honest with you. The phone is one of the biggest enemies we have today in the church as we think about that because it's always beeping and it's always wanting and it's always in that pocket when it goes buzz and it's saying to that person oh look at me look at me and don't listen to him amen and that's exactly what they're doing so i want you to warn you tonight about preaching and teaching if it's only entertainment you know it's not good so look at our text verse for just a moment not forlorn that means to seclude or separate but showing all good fidelity in other words conviction that they may adorn, that means to garnish, like we put on the tie, to decorate, to put in proper order, 
the doctrine, the truth of God our Savior in all things. Let me say this. Teaching is helping to adorn in proper order the Bible student with the truth of God in all things. That means teaching in all areas, and it'll help us tonight if we do that. Now, here tonight is some things that we should adorn with truth, uh, that we should adorn the truth with. First of all, number one, and am I talking too fast? Y'all, y'all good? Everybody good? Everybody called up? And I got to, I'll clue you in if you, if, if, if I get ahead of, of the answers that you, that you're writing down, you just remember, you got the answers. You don't sweat it, man. You got the answers. So listen to me. Adorn the truth with simplicity. Listen carefully. How many of you ever heard a sermon that was, I mean, it was meaty. But it just kept getting meatier and meatier. And after a while, man, it was just way over my head. I've heard those. And and I, I appreciate somebody that's scholarly and somebody that's learned. But most people don't have a Ph.D. in theology. They don't. And if we're not careful, we're going to go way over their head. And we're not going to give them what they need. And I'm going to be honest with you. If I go over your head or if you go over my head and you're teaching, you're not helping. You're not feeding. You see, we need to, to bring the fodder down low where everybody can get something from the Word of God. That's why that uh, a preacher that preaches simple sermons such as Bobby Robinson, Brother Bobby Priest and pastor of Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walkertown, North Carolina, and he's gone on to be with the Lord, but Brother Bobby preached some of the most simple sermon outlines and people loved him and respected him. And, and Brother Bobby Robinson could go deep if he wanted to, but he chose to keep it simple. Can I say to you, as a teacher, as a preacher, whoever you are, uh, to keep it simple, but adorn the truth with simplicity. Teaching is the transference of knowledge. There's a lot of professors who have knowledge, but they don't have the ability to transfer that which they know. And uh, just, just understand that. The teacher who can take great Bible truths and transfer them to a student, and the student can understand those truths, that is adorning the truth with simplicity. When we can get a truth over to you, one of the greatest truths I, I learned in Bible college years ago, when you go into a church, and this is deep, it's theologically deep, it's so deep, I don't know if any of y'all will get it or not, but as a preacher, when you go into a church as a, as a new pastor, don't go in like a bull in a china shop. And that's what Brother Byerly always said. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. And you know what? That is a simple truth that preachers need to understand. Because I know some men that went in like a bull in a china shop and they didn't last long. Amen? And so we need to understand that. Adorn the truth with simplicity. And then secondly, adorn the truth with sincerity. Be real. Be real. Hey, you know what? Can I can I testify tonight? Before God called me to preach, a long time ago, I was a backslidden Christian. And I'm ashamed of it. And I lived a number of years till I was about 25 years old. From the time I was about 15. And, uh, and I won't go into the, any of the details of that. But let me say this. I rededicated my life to the Lord. And you know what happened not long after that? I began to sing in the choir, and I began to be faithful to the house of God. I began to tithe, and I began to uh, see God turn my life around. And then before long, one day, uh, before the appointment of new Sunday school teachers, the pastor called me on the phone, and he asked me, he said, would you be willing to teach a Sunday school class? And my mind immediately thought, which class, the adults or the senior adults? Which class would he put me in? And you know what? To my dismay, I said readily, I said without any hesitation, I said, I'll be happy to. And he said, well, I want to put you with the junior boys. And you know what? I thank God for that. Because do you know what happened? It changed my life for the good. I studied to prepare for the junior boys just as I would have for the senior adults. To be honest with you, I bought a big old Bible commentary. My wife 
at me like, are you going to preach? I said, no, I'm not going to preach. I'm just teaching Sunday school. And then for a few years, I taught Sunday school. And amazingly, God called me to preach. But you know what? I had one of those young men come up to me not long ago. And he put his hand. He's not a young man anymore himself. And he put his hand on my shoulder and looked down. He's a great old big tall boy. And he looked down upon me and he said, do you remember me? He said, I was in your Sunday school classes. Some of the things that you taught and the sincerity of your heart and the way that you reached us, it still is in my mind. I'll never forget it. And I appreciate it. You know what? That meant a lot to me. And, you know, whatever we do, let's do it with simplicity. But let's also do it with sincerity. Can I say this? A man of God that gets up and preaches the gospel, he should have sincerity in his heart. He should be genuine in his heart. And that's exactly what it means. It means genuine. It means sound. It means whole. It means not hypercritical. Amen. We need to be that way. And those who teach will know if you're sincere. One of the things that I, that one of my pet peeves that I try not to do, and sometimes I catch myself doing it, is saying, y'all need to when I'm preaching. You need to. You need to. You know, that, that, that doesn't do anything for me when the preacher excludes himself. Can I say this? I need preaching more than the people in the pew. And I say, I, and I include me. And if, I, and if I'm talking to them, I try to say, me and you need to do better. And we do. So let's adorn ourselves with simplicity. Let's adorn ourselves with sincerity. Thirdly, let's adorn ourselves and adorn the truth with humility. You know what? We should be humble in our teaching and preaching. Ivan Dameron. How many of y'all did you did y'all ever know Ivan Dameron? What a man. You know what he would say? He was a he was a preacher's preacher. He was a, a prince of preachers in this area. Brother Ivan's ministry consisted of going to hurt churches and helping them to heal. Ivan's one of his greatest sayings was, Pray for me. I need the prayers and you need the practice. Pretty good one. That's a great statement. But Ivan Dameron was a great example of godly humility in the preacher. Humility is a quality or condition of being humble, modest opinion, or estimate of one's own self. And I say this, I don't like preachers that think they're better than everybody else. I don't like that. I don't think it's right. I don't think they should act that way. I don't like teachers that act that way either. And you know what? We're, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. You can't minister on a high horse, but you sure can on a donkey. Now, Tony Malay said that I did. That's his quote. Right there it is. Tony Malay. You can't minister on a high horse, but you sure can on a donkey. So it's true. Let's, let's, let's adorn the truth with simplicity. Let's adorn the truth with sincerity. Let's adorn the truth with humility. And fourthly, I hope it is. No, it ain't. Let's adorn, Brother Nathan, the truth with adaptability. What do you mean, preacher? Well, our lesson says adaptability is taking the here from where they are and bring them to where you are. And that's exactly what we should do. You know what? Too many times, I, I, I want to move right now. I want to, I want to run. I'm going to try to stay right here because I know the camera is not going to allow me to run. But too many times, I'll get in the car and start that engine and want to go preaching. And I'll take off, and, and if we're not careful, I'm going to leave somebody behind. You see, the, the, the idea is for you to get everybody in that vehicle with you as you're taking that truth and you're going forward with it. And see, leaving people behind, it just leaves them out in the cold. Turn over to John chapter 4 for just a moment, and uh, we'll read what... Jesus has to say and do with the Samaritan's woman. John 4, verse 3 and 4 down through probably verse number number 15. We're going to read those verses. The Bible says, verse 3, He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus there journey set thus on the well and it was about the sixth hour 
Then cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said, Thou knewest the gift of God, and who it was that saith unto thee, or to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest ask him of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep from, from whence. Then hast thou that living water. And thou art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us unto the well, and drank thereof, himself and his children and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She had come to draw water. And the first thing, the Lord did here in this situation. He asked her for a drink of water. And then he offered her living water. What did Jesus do? He adapted to the circumstance. He adorned the truth with adaptability. And let me say this. If we're preaching or teaching, whatever we're doing, there's circumstances going to come up that's going to have an effect upon your audience. Last two weeks has been dramatic here at the church because of Brother Ryan and what's going on with him. Uh, Sunday before last, it was very mournful. People were mourning and they thought that he had passed away. And this Sunday, the people were dumbfounded over the events of the week and some of them were afraid and didn't understand. And so what we did, we didn't go to Matthew. We went to another place in the Bible. And I gave 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and went back all the way to the book of Exodus to chapter number 14 and preached about the Red Sea and the great miracle that God did for the children of Israel. God is a miracle working God. You see, sometimes we have to adapt to what is going on around us. And even in teaching Sunday school, it needs to be done that way. A good teacher, a good preacher will adapt to the circumstances of his audience. And he will. When there's a death in the church, when there's a death in the Sunday school class, you have to learn to adapt to the circumstances. And then, not only that, adorn the truth with practicality. Now, I like this. And that means pertaining or to practice or action. And then we, we think about this. Uh, we think about practical things in our life. Prayer is learned behavior. Jesus said, Lord, teach us to pray. Giving is worship. That's a practical. Listen, God is not really wanting your money, but he wants your obedience. You see, the problem a lot of people have, we don't obey. I'm dealing with a situation today, and I wouldn't call a name at all, but I'm dealing with a situation today with a man who has all kinds of problems, spiritual problems, physical problems, financial problems. But the problem lies in a lot of things that he's not doing that he should be. He's not faithful. He doesn't give. And so there's a lot of things that add to that. We need to be practical with people like that. And then there are steps to solving problems. And I believe children should obey their parents and they need to be taught to obey their parents. There's some practicality in that because if they're going to live a long lifetime, they need to learn to obey their parents. And amen. And I'll say grandparents too. Amen. Sometimes I have to have a word of prayer with my grandchildren individually, sometimes collectively. Amen. I have to grab them and say, you listen, you're not going to do that. And you're not going to be disrespectful to your grandmother. And certainly not to me. And I'm not going to allow that. But you know what? I love them. It doesn't mean that I'm mean, but I want them to know there's a reason that I say they need to learn to be respectful. And it's because of the promises of the Lord. Not only should we adorn ourselves in all these other ways that I've spoke of, but we should adorn the truth with reachability. If we are to teach students, we must be in reachability. 
And that's very true. Not only should we teach the truth to them, but we should teach them how to teach and reach others with the same truths we have taught them. You see, a good pastor is a disciple-making pastor. A good Sunday school teacher is one that trains other Sunday school teachers. Y'all hearing me? That's the truth. I, I had the privilege last uh, March, May, sometime in March, I believe, this year, uh, to go to California and uh, got to go to North Valley Baptist Church with Brother Jack Trever, his pastor, and went to their pastor's uh, school and, and encouragement. It was like a camp meeting. And as I was there, I noticed that their Sunday school had just blowed out. It just, it's amazing how it's blowed out. The Sunday school class, the class I went in had 130-some people in the class. It was amazing. And then the teacher came to me and he said, uh, he said, when I started this class, pastor said, you can't take anybody from any other class to form your class. He said, okay. And then secondly, the pastor said, and another condition, you can't take any church member that's coming here to church. He said, well, what am I going to do? He said, you're going to go out and compel them. And so that's exactly what he, Brother Alvin did. He went out the highways and hedges. He got the roughest looking people you've ever seen in your life. They got rough marks on them. They look rough. And boy, I want to tell you, but what he's doing, he's teaching the people. He's not going out and getting them all. But he's taught the people in the class to go out and reach them. You see, that's where it's at. If you want to grow as a Christian, you train others to do what you're doing. And then they go out and they compel and they train. And there's the growth pattern. And that's the way it should be. That's God's way. Amen. It's God's way. So same principle. Same principle in church planting. When a missionary goes to the field and plants a church, what is the model for the church he plants? Should be what? Somebody say his home church. Sadly to say, a lot of them are not modeling their home churches. You know why? Because their home church is not really what it should be. That's true. But it should be a soul winning church. So we need to, to adorn the truth with reachability. It should be his home church, and a lot of times it's not. And then we should adorn the truth with mobility. Now, here's the truth that needs to be understood. I was preaching in a church that the only restrooms were in the Sunday school department, which was behind the platform. Listen carefully. During the preaching, several people would get up and they would walk down the aisle to go to the restroom. And I think when this occurred, every eye was diverted from the preacher to the person going to the restroom. And, and, I, and I understand that can happen. And I do know that. And when, and when nature calls, you can't help that. And when, when a child has to go to the restroom, I understand that. But in times like these, a teacher or a preacher must be mobile enough to do something to gain back the attention of his hearers again. If there's a distraction in the class, you ever been in a class where there's a distraction? The teacher's got to respond to that. In, in, in a worship service, you ever had a distraction? Sure. The preacher has got to be mobile enough to do something. If something's going on over here and the pastor's in the middle, he needs to move this way. Maybe he needs to go back into the con congregation. I don't know. But he needs to be mobile enough to do what's necessary. Amen? I will say this. I warn churches when you build a church it's not a good idea to put clear windows because there's a lot of action outside there is and listen we have classes in these rooms these screens are not just to block the sun even we got them in every room and the reason for that because there's a lot of action outside if, if it was sunny and the and, and you could look out the window during any time you're in here in this class there'd be people walking up now it's a distraction to even bible students and so we put these up to try to dis uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking forward to to try to discourage people from looking out the windows and keeping their attention on what is going on and and I'm gonna say this probably one of the loudest noisemakers in the church and distraction is children so that does that mean we take children out of the church no but we teach them and we learn I'm gonna be honest with you babies crying don't bother me in the least they don't they don't bother. I'm glad to have babies. Our church is filled with babies. We we had a couple had a baby just two days ago, and I'm thankful for that. You know what that means? It means another crying baby's coming to church. Thank God for it. 
Because what mm-hmm. happens is one of these days, the little crying babies grow up to be toddlers. And they don't cry, cry quite as much. And then they'll grow up to be the next stage and the next stage. And then when they get to be adult, they start crying again. But thank God, hallelujah, for babies that are in the church, we need to adapt. Don't get mad at them. Don't turn your neck and look at the mama. Just be gracious and let the preacher do his job. And if he needs to lift up his voice, let him lift up his voice. And, and, and if he needs to come back there and pass by where mama and the baby is, and the little while mama will get up and she'll go out and take care of that baby. Don't worry about it. Keep your eyes on the preacher. But if you're the preacher, you're the teacher, you got to keep focused, and sometimes it's hard. It is. You can lose your train of thought, and it don't take much to look for me to lose my train of thought in my EJ man. It sure don't. Well, uh, woo, brother Tony has really laid it on us tonight. I got one, two, three, four, five. Let me just give you these. I'm just going to read them. All right. Let's adorn the truth with predictability. By this, we mean that the teacher preacher must must strive to be consistent. In the messages and teaching he does. Huh. Brother Tony wrote on here, for me it's spit. Like that way. So he's consistently spit. He may have been talking about me on that one. I don't know. But let's 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 adorn the truth with predictability. Amen. We need preaching and teaching. And it needs to be predictable. People need to know kind of what to expect. Amen. Let's not be moody and sour. Let's let's be joyous. Let's give the gospel. But let's love people. Amen. Let's love them because they need somebody. They're looking for answers. And there's answers in the church house. But man, if we're sour and we're down on everything and down on the world and, and down on politics and down on the economy and down on this, hey, I ain't got time for that. I don't. I don't. I don't preach that stuff. I try to stick with the Word of God and give them something that they'll, they'll help them. Amen. And I realize we're in a mess. And it doesn't take a I don't need to remind them. It doesn't help anything. So let's be predictable. And then let's notice something else. He said, adorn the truth with humanity. Be human. Be human. Some share. Uh, share some of your life with your pupils. Huh. Boy, I could tell you some stories. And one of them is wrote right here in this paper. I gotta give you a break before. I got angry one time after I was called to preach. I've been angry a bunch. I got mad just the other day about something. You can be mad and not see it. But I was working for Lance, and and, and uh, somebody called the house in the summertime. My, my son was fourteen. He was home, and the man thought that it was me. My son's voice had changed. His voice and mine were very similar. The man called the house and he cursed my son. And he told him, he said, you've thrown trash out on my property. And I'm, I'm going to get you for that. And he wouldn't tell him who he was. And my son called me. He was really upset. And I said, well, son, I said, did you do that? He said, no, Dad. He, he thought that I was you. And he said he's going to call back to see me. Well, you know what I did? I took my fist and I imagined that guy's face. And there was a bag of, or not a bag, but a box of potato chips that I sold for a living. Man, I hit that box. And if you bought that bag of potato chips next to us, I am so sorry. I apologize. But I was so mad. Ain't nobody going to do that to my boy. He didn't do anything, and I knew I hadn't threw nobody. I hadn't threw any trash out. And that evening, the phone went up. Man, I was still aggravated. But you know what? The Holy Spirit had dealt with my heart about my anger. And and I was preaching at that time. So I, I got the phone. I said, hello. And on the other end, there was a voice that said, Mr. Schumann. And I said, yes, it is. He said, I called, to, you called your son today in Houston him thinking it was you and he said I said some awful rude things he said but you know this afternoon I ran into somebody that knew you and said Mr. Schumann is a man of God he never did that he never threw trash on my property he, and he said preacher I don't know how it got on my property he said I have not a clue he said but I believe that you didn't do it and I said I sure didn't 
He said, I've called to apologize to you and your son. Now, listen, what if I had answered that phone knowing that was that rascal? I don't know who he was to this day. I really don't. But boy, my flesh really wanted to have a prayer meeting with him. And it wasn't in the right way. But you know what? We, we just need to understand we're all human. If I were to take time and talk to each one of you, there'd be something that you could tell me about your humanity. And it ain't always good. You see, we can't paint ourselves perfect because we ain't. There's only one. His name is Jesus. Boy, I'm so glad. Thank God. Hallelujah. That I know Him. And He knows me. So we need to adorn the truth with humanity. Just, just be who you are. Share some of your life with your students. Share some. When you're preaching, it'd be good to share some of your life story. I wouldn't go off on too bad of stuff, but I mean, I, you know, I've seen preachers get up and they talk about some of the things they used to do and they go into detail. I wouldn't go into deep detail. But I want to tell you, I'm ashamed of some of the things that I do. But I'm glad that the Savior loves me. We can be human. And we should be. And if you're going to be a good teacher, you're going to have to be human. You're going to have to show yourself human. Your humanity. And then adorn the truth with stability. Let me say it this way. Just live what you teach. Live what you teach. If you teach against alcohol, don't be caught down to the store buying Miller ponies. Don't be caught. I walked up on a guy one time. He was assistant Sunday school superintendent at a church. And there in his hand was an eight pack of Miller ponies. You say, how do you know they were Miller ponies? Because I know what they look like. And I had told the Lord and repented that I would never touch another one. And he stood with them. What did you do, preacher? Well, I prayed for him. I prayed for him. I prayed for him. Wasn't long after that, he resigned and left the church. I prayed for him. I didn't start any rumors. I just prayed for him. And you know what? That's what we need to do. Because I want to tell you, be careful your sins will find you out. We ain't perfect, so don't act like we are, amen. I'll tell you, you know, we ain't perfect, none of us. Adorn the truth with identity. Share your humanity in such a manner that people can connect with you. Be that person that people can connect with. Be real. If you're real, they're going to know you're real. And they want to connect with people who are real. And then, I believe, I like this last one, probably one of the best ones. Adorn the truth with excitability. If you ain't excited about what Jesus done for you, man, what are you doing preaching or teaching? I want to say this. The choir last night over there at Charity Hill, they sung the song, He Lifted Me Out. I was sitting there and I said, Lord, I'm going to behave myself. I'm going to sit here. I ain't going to shout. I may amen the preacher, but that choir ain't going to make me shout. And they got up there and started singing. He lifted me out from the deep miry clay. He planted my feet on the heavenly way. I'll shout it wherever I go, for I want the whole world to know. I'm glad that he loved me so, that he lifted me out. Hallelujah to God. It makes me excited tonight. Makes me want to preach when I think about what Jesus did for me on the cross of Calvary when he gave his life for my sins and your sins, the sins of the entirety of the world. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We just need to praise him tonight. Well, we need to get excited about the things of God. Him and I'll tell you, think about how good it is right now to think about heaven is ahead of us. The best is yet to come. Hallelujah. Well, let's... Adorn the doctrine. Adorn the doctrine. Put chocolate around that arm. Not forlorn, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Father, we love you. Lord, thank you, God, for this group of students. Lord, thank you for this class. Lord, we thank you, God, for your blessed Son, Lord, our Savior. Lord, we sure love you, God. Thank you, Lord, for allowing such a worm as I, Lord, to stand tonight. God, I'm so unworthy. But, Lord, you are so worthy. And, Lord, I thank you for the privilege. God, I pray out of this class that every one of these people, Lord, would be used to teach and preach and give the good news of the gospel, Lord, to whosoever we are. Lord, let us live our life. In obedience to your commands, Lord, let us love you with all our heart. We thank you again.
Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Take you about a five, ten a minute break. And we'll be back with the second class.